Okay, we're back. Make sure I'm recording. Okay. So it's gonna, this is gonna be respiration four. Oh, let me pull up uh, let me the slideshow from current slide. Okay, so it's gonna be a really short one because we're almost finished. Um, blood gas is a respiratory rhythm. It's important to realize that your resp respiratory rhythm, how often you're breathing, is dependent upon uh, hydrogen ions. pH drives how uh, often you breathe, not oxygen. Uh, and that's and and so the, so the carbon dioxide concentration of your blood has much greater uh, control over how often you breathe than oxygen because it's linked to hydrogen ions in the ubiquitous equation. Oxygen helps that has almost nothing to do with. Uh, occasionally, under pathological situations, uh, oxygen will have something to do with it. And with people with emphysema, I believe. Um, or if somehow the oxygen gets really low in your, in your blood, if you, if you uh, and this will be, we'll talk about this in the uh, group activity. If somehow, like underwater, you stay underwater a long time and your blood oxygen gets really low, then oxygen will drive your breathing. That's called hypoxic drive, but it has to get down to like, so like 60 millimeters of mercury or less before oxygen really has an effect on your breathing. It's, it's almost all, always carbon dioxide. Um, okay, respiration exercise, hyperpnea, deeper breathing. And when this happens, well, if you do it, if I do this and I'm exercising, I'm going to go into uh, hypocapnia and I'm going to go with a blood acid, uh, blood alkalosis. But if I'm exercising, I naturally go into hyperpnea because of sensory, inform sensory information from proprioceptors. I start moving my, my uh, arms, legs a lot. The proprioceptors send information to the DRG, the DRC sends information to the VRG saying, we gotta be more deeper, all right? Uh, motor output from cerebral cortex. You know you're gonna be exercising. You can tell your, uh, 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 you can control your diaphragm, make it go uh, a little deeper. Uh, and conscious anticipation of the fact that I'm gonna be exercising. So you actually start going into deeper breathing before you start exercising. Right? But here's the thing, why don't you go into um, uh, uh, respiratory alkalosis when you're exercising? Because, you, because the CO2 and O2 don't change. Well, the CO2 doesn't change. Because remember, if you're exercising, you make it a lot more CO2, right? So if you breathe deeply, if I just breathe deeply here, I'm blowing off a lot more CO2 than I should be. So I'm going to go with the respiratory alkalosis. But if I'm exercising, I make a lot more CO2. There's a lot more CO2 in my blood. So breathing deeply gets rid of the correct amount of CO2. So your blood pH doesn't change. Your blood O2 doesn't change because breathing more de uh, deeply, that's going to put more oxygen into your blood. It's going to stay at 100% uh, uh, saturated when it leaves your lungs. And uh, so everything, everything's good. Okay, so hyperpnea doesn't lead, lead to any change in blood, o, P, blood PO2 or blood CO2. All right, let's get into some disorders now. COPD, chronic obstructionary pulmonary disease. Two types, chronic bronchitis and emphysema, and they go hand in hand with each other. Chronic bronchitis is irritation of the bronchi uh, through anything. It could be uh, uh, it could be an allergic response, or it could be from cigarette smoking. And emphysema is the um, the breaking down of alveoli. They break down into into 
much fewer alveoli, much larger alveoli. So surface area goes down, right? And we know that's one of the things that affect, affects the rate of diffusion and how much CO2 and O2 can pass across that respiratory membrane. So people with emphysema have real trouble getting rid of enough CO2 uh, and getting enough oxygen. And they often go get, have polycythemia, really high red blood cell level, level because they go with hypoxia because they're, they're not getting enough oxygen to, into their blood. And, uh, and they uh, 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 generally have to, have to have forced exhalations and try to push out more CO2 uh, with, with each breath. And it becomes exhausting because then they have to be at forced exhalations. And then they have to, so the exhalations have to, be, have to be active. So you have to burn ATP you know, they, they exhale and most people don't. Okay. So smoking, how many ways smoking uh, uh, is bad for you? Uh, let, let me count the ways. I mean, wow. It's not only has really respiratory problems, but cardiovascular problems as well. But also obviously, remember, smoking doesn't cause lung cancer. It just greatly increases your risk for it. Remember, uh, there, your risk for cancers uh, is, is variable. I mean, uh, um, um, there can be uh, people who uh, smoke their entire life, they call it the Winston Churchill syndrome, smoke uh, chain smokers their entire lives. And then, and then they, they, you know, Winston Churchill died of something, it wasn't uh, lung cancer. But then there's the, uh, Wife of Christopher Reeves, you know, the actor who was uh, quadriplegic, she died of lung cancer. How many cigarettes did she smoke in her life? Zippo, none. Died of lung cancer. So life's a crapshoot. So it just, it's just that smoking is going to greatly increase you, your risk for lung cancer. If you're already predisposed to it, you're going to get lung cancer. And I'm not going to go into different kinds of uh, lung cancer, screaming cell, Adenocarcinoma in oak cell. Some are more serious than others. We're not going to get into that. Okay. Then, then we can get into decompression sickness, the bends. Here's the thing that we sort of, sort of skipped over. So most of the uh, area of breathing now is nitrogen, right? But what does this nitrogen do for you? Well, do you need nitrogen? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, proteins are made of amino acids, which have nitrogen in them. You need nitrogen. Uh, nucleic acids are uh, nitrogenous bases. Uh, you need nitrogen to make these big, important molecules. Do you get it from the air that you breathe? No, you don't. You don't get anything from the nitrogen you breathe in. It does absolutely nothing. It dissolves into your blood, you breathe it in. 78% of the air you breathe in nitrogen comes in there, dissolves in your blood. Not a lot, it's not that soluble. Travels throughout your entire body, does absolutely nothing, and then you breathe it out. And that's it. And you never have to worry about it. Except if you do one particular activity. And often, it, often it's recreational. And that it's self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. Scuba is an acronym for that. Go scuba diving, you gotta worry about uh, nitrogen. Because when you go scuba diving, you breathe compressed air. Uh, and so the deeper you down you go, the more compressed the air has to be because you can't expand your lungs when, you, when all this pressure of the water around you. So you have to expand your lungs by breathing pressurized air. When you breathe that pressurized air, more nitrogen enters the blood than normal at sea level when you're breathing regular air. Remember how much, that's part of Henry's law, how much, um, no, Dalton's law, I'm sorry, Dalton's law and Henry's law. How much of a gas enters a aqueous solution depending upon what the concentration is, how much, what's the pressure gradient? When you're breathing compressed air, the pressure gradient for nitrogen 
a lot higher. So you get higher concentration of nitrogen in your blood. Well, there, then, since you have that, you can't just rise to the surface really rapidly, because if you do that, uh, the nitrogen will come out of your so solution in your blood vessels as bubbles, and you have bubbles all over your cardiovascular system, and this is like lethal. You'll block, these bubbles will block all these blood vessels and cause death. This is called decompression sickness, or also known as the death. So they go down scuba diving, you gotta follow these, what's called dive tables. Now I actually know, know a little about this, I've never gone to scuba dive. But then you gotta follow these dive tables, how you slowly have to ascend so that you blow off this, this nitrogen, this extra nitrogen that's in your blood. So when you get to the surface, you have the normal amount of nitrogen in your blood and you don't form these nitrogen bubbles. Um, so that's, uh, uh, yeah, important. Uh, but there was uh, something I didn't mention here. There's, there, there are people that are so called free divers. Uh, I think this is kind of crazy, but it's a competition that people do is they take one big breath on the surface and they try to go down as deep as they can with one breath. They go, and the record is like 200 something feet. They go down, they come up really fast. Uh, and how come they don't get the beds? Well, because they took one breath on the surface and they held their breath for the entire time they're down below. That's why like a whale would get nitrogen uh, a decompression sickness because it takes one breath. It's holding its breath the whole time it's below. So it isn't any extra nitrogen there, right? So there's no problem with that, but uh, there is a problem with, with drowning uh, when you do free diving. Anyway. Then, one really insidious problem is carbon monoxide, CO. It is a uh, odorless, colorless, poisonous gas. And it's formed when, any, when anything burns, it forms carbon monoxide, anything. And the problem is carbon monoxide attaches to hemoglobin, takes the place of oxygen in hemoglobin. And it binds the oxygen almost irreversible, like much stronger bi uh, binding of, of CO to hemoglobin than oxygen. So if you're in an area of high carbon monoxide, your, all your hemoglobin is going to be covered with carbon monoxide, not going to be carrying any oxygen, and you will asphyxiate. It's called carbon monoxide poison. So that's why you should never, ever be in an enclosed environment with something that's burning because this carbon monoxide is undetectable. And, uh, and if you're in a, a high carbon monoxide environment, you will just, you will not even notice it. You just, you just, you'll tend to be a little uh, sleepy. You'll, you'll get sleepy and you'll lose consciousness and go to sleep. And if you stay there, you'll never wake up because all of your hemoglobin will be covered with carbon monoxide and this happens to people all the time, uh, usually accidentally, when they don't vent something properly that they're burning. You gotta have some, you gotta vent these things properly. Um, and uh, you can buy carbon monoxide detectives for your house just in case uh, uh, it starts to get high for, for whatever reason and you can't detect it. So anyway. So hypoxia, I think this is the last slide. In, uh, a, uh, a lowered ability of your body to carry oxygen, hypoxia. A hypoxemic hypoxia is in an inadequate pulmonary gas exchange. And this is, this could be a real natural process. If you, if you go mountain climbing, you go with hypoxia, a, 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 a hypoxemic hypoxia because the, the, the partial pressure of oxygen is much lower at, on top of a, uh, of a mountain. And um, so the partial pressure of oxygen in your VLI is lower and you're not getting enough oxygen. So that's when you ha have to uh, release, remember, release EPO from the kidneys, goes to the bone marrow, increases retroparesis, and you can adapt to altitude. 
ischemic hypoxia is inadequate blood circulation. Somehow, this blood vessel is blocked, maybe by plaque or whatever. Uh, something's blocking a, 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 an embolism or something, and the, the, the tissue is not being adequately perfused. This is ischemic hypoxic and can lead to the death of that tissue. Anemic hypoxia due to anemia. And there's a, there's a bunch of different kinds of anemia. One is um, a couple types of uh, nutritional anemia. You don't get enough iron. You can't, you can't make uh, hemoglobin without the, without the iron. You don't get enough vitamin B12. It's called pernicious anemia. Uh, you won't be able to uh, make as much uh, hemoglobin as you need to. So you go over to anemic hypoxia. Then there's histotoxic hypoxia. And this is just, a, I think it's only one day. This is a metabolic poison preventing the use of oxygen. And I think the only one, I think, is called, uh, is called hydrogen cyanide. It is a, uh, uh, another odorless, colorless, deadly gas. And, uh, and usually you don't have to worry about, about it. You're not going to encounter this stuff unless you start chewing on, plant, uh, on fruit seeds. Well, who does that? I don't know. But like apple seeds, cherry seeds, peach seeds, you don't want to chew on those. They, they, they actually are, are full of hydrogen cyanide. So that's called histotoxic hypoxia. And then there's oxygen toxicity. A hyperoxia, you don't want to take too much oxygen. Oxygen is actually a really dangerous gas. Uh, it it um, rips apart molecules. Um, and it's, uh, as I mentioned uh, it's in my uh, biology cl uh, cl classes, uh, the early Earth had no oxygen in the, in the environment. And it's very fortunate it did, because if it did, we wouldn't be here talking to other because life wouldn't evolve on this planet. Oxygen rips molecules apart. We have to have special enzymes in our cells to protect ourselves against oxygen. And that's why it's good to uh, eat, uh, like I just drank some green tea, antioxidants, good to eat chocolate and coffee and tea has antioxidants and green and, and brightly colored vegetables have antioxidants that help give oxygen electrons and stop oxygen damage. One of the reasons we age is we damage from oxygen. So you don't want too much oxygen. Uh, and uh, that would actually cause hyperoxy. Let me end with that, with uh, we talked about preemies having trouble breathing, getting enough oxygen because they don't make enough surfactant. Well, they used to use high oxygen, 100% oxygen to give these preemies. And it's turning out to having lots of blind infants. And they couldn't figure it out why. Turns out that if uh, it's like almost, it's like paradoxical. You give 100% oxygen to a newborn infant and you will cause hypoxia in, the, in, in their eyes. Their eyes will be deprived of oxygen in some perverse way and cause blindness, and they finally figured out uh, what was causing it. So uh, uh, infants, nobody gives infants uh, a high oxygen, whether they have low surfactant or not, because you're going to cause blindness. Okay. And I think that's it. And that is it. We are done that with uh, respiration four, and we're all done with the, with the, uh, with uh, respiration. So, I'll uh, see you later next week, and uh, we'll talk more um, respiration. So, so long for now.